Script, today's scripture reading is from Exodus 34, 14. Exodus 34, 14. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Amen. Good morning and a happy Sabbath. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Sharon, wherever she is, for that beautiful song. That was one of my favorite songs. It's so true that people need the Lord. And we want to talk about that Lord of the Bible. But before we do that, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming together as a people to worship you and to hear your message. We pray now for your Holy Spirit to abide with us, to lead us step by step, so that we can come to know you more and to love you more. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading from Exodus 34, 14 stated that the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. So here we see God himself declaring his own name as Jealous with a capital J. So who is this God that calls himself a jealous God. You know, we talk a lot about God's love, but not so much about God's jealousy. So this morning, we're going to take a brief walk through the Bible to find out what kind of God is this God who declares his own name as jealous. If we get to know him better, we can trust him more, and we can all deepen our relationship with this Lord of the Bible. Now, this is not the first time in Exodus 34 that God addressed himself as a jealous God. So let's turn our Bibles to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, to sort of review and refresh about this God who declared himself as a jealous God. Exodus 20, as Seventh-day Adventists, we all know this chapter well. It's a one on Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, in verses 2 and 3, we have the first commandment, right? Where God declares, I am your God, so have no other gods besides me. And in verse 4, we have the second commandment. He says, don't make any graven image in likeness of anything. And he continues in the second commandment. Let's read verses 5 and 6. Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So here in this second commandment, God says, don't worship or serve other gods. Why? Because I am a jealous God. And did you notice in verses 5 and 6, we saw two groups of people? The first group, they believe in God, but they choose to cling to other gods. They're commandment breakers. 
because God said, have no other God, but they want to cling to other gods. So to those people, God is going to visit their iniquity. That means God will judge and bring punishment for their sins. Now, what does it mean? It said that those people of them that hate me. Why is this group described as hating God? Remember what Jesus said. It's, you can find it later in Luke 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. There's no middle ground. It's either you're going to love one and hate the other. See, it means to, if you cherish other gods, it means to hate God. Not so much by feelings or emotions of hatred. We may profess to love God with our mouth, but in our hearts, we are hating God if we cling to other gods. So this is a principle declared by Jesus himself. We cannot love God with a divided heart. Did you see the second group? They believe in God and they choose to forsake other gods by the grace of God. And they're going to keep the commandments. And for those people, they're given mercy instead of punishment. Their sins are forgiven. They're going to hate all the other gods that interfere with the relationship with the Lord of the Bible. So they're going to forsake all the other gods, and they're going to love God with their whole heart. So there are two groups. Always there's going to be two groups. One, they cling to other gods in their hearts. They're commandment breakers. They hate God. They have no mercy. But if you let go of the other gods in your hearts, they're going to be commandment keepers. They love God, and they're going to receive mercy. Now, other gods, we know that it could be anything or any person placed above God, an idol. And we're going to talk about it a little later in our study. So let's turn back to Exodus 34 and read from verse 14, which was our scripture reading. Exodus 34, verse 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. So if we continue to cling to other gods, God is going to be a jealous God. But why did God declare his own name as jealous with a capital J? Well, we know that names in the Bible describe a person's character. So being jealous is part of God's character, who he is. Now, in the same chapter, Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6. Okay, verses 5 and 6. See, God had already declared his name, his own character, in response to Moses' request to show him God's glory. So let's read verses 5 and 6. Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6 says, and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Okay. So here we see God declaring his own character. And then verse 7 keeping mercy for thousands, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Do you see the same two groups of people we saw in Exodus 20? One group, they're going to cling to other gods in their hearts. They're commandment breakers. And here they're called the guilty. Why? Because they refuse to repent of their sins. They hold on to their sins. They're going to be punished. But the other group, they're going to put away other gods in their hearts. They become commandment keepers. They're forgiven. And they receive mercy. So let's put this all together. Okay? Here's what God is saying. God says, I am merciful, gracious, long-suffering, full of goodness and truth to all who choose to repent. Put away other gods and serve me with your whole heart. However, God is saying, I am a jealous God to all who choose not to repent, cling to other gods, and continue to serve me with a divided heart. You might profess to love me, but actually you hate me. Even though you might be keeping the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, if you have other gods, you're breaking the commandment. So what happens then? If we choose to serve other gods and God becomes a jealous God, what happens next? Let's turn our Bibles to Deuteronomy. We're in Exodus, so you go through Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're going to read from verses 23 and 24. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 23 and 24. The Bible says, Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. So a jealous God becomes a consuming fire to those who do not forsake other gods. What else happens when God becomes a jealous God and a consuming fire. Same book, Deuteronomy, but chapter 6, just a couple chapters ahead. Chapter 6, we're going to read from verses 14 and 15. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. God says, Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. So, for people who cling to other gods, God becomes a jealous God, and provokes, provoke the anger of God. The fire of his anger would destroy and consume those people. Now, so far, do you see a picture of God, an image of a jealous God, angry, vengeful God, a scary God? He says, if you obey me, I will have mercy, but if you disobey, I will destroy you with a consuming fire. Is that the Lord of the Bible? Is that the Lord that we believe in? Let's go to chapter 7, same book. Chapter 7, we're going to read from verse 6 through 9. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6 says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. 
The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. Verse 8, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he has sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth, keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The relationship between God and his people, Israel, was based on love. A covenant relationship is a love relationship. See, God's jealousy is based on a very special, exclusive, intimate love relationship. It's not a, a like an envy or resentful feeling of jealousy, no. The more love, the more jealousy. That's why Paul in the New Testament, you can just jot down 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, 2, where Paul says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So Paul called this jealousy godly jealousy in the context of a marriage relationship. Christ, the husband, and his people, his bride. This godly jealousy is a holy jealousy. It's totally different from satanic jealousy. You know what happened in heaven? Lucifer indulged jealousy and envy toward Christ. That's satanic jealousy. You can read about that in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 36 and 37. In the same book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 306, Ellen White defines what this jealousy is. I'm going to quote, I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The close and sacred relation of God to his people is represented under the figure of marriage. Idolatry being spiritual adultery, the displeasure of God against it is fitly called jealousy. When we turn to another God, it's going to provoke displeasure in God's heart. And that's what is jealousy, godly, holy jealousy. So, in other words, jealousy is an expression of God's broken heart when he is rejected and hated by people that he loves so much. Now, did ancient Israel remain faithful to God at his, as his bride? No. We can read about that in so many places, but let's turn to chapter 32 of the same book, Deuteronomy 32. And we're going to read from verse 16. Deuteronomy 32 Verse 16, what did ancient Israel do? Verse 16 says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. And then let's skip over to verse 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. 
and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke, provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So ancient Israel provoked God to jealousy and anger. And the Bible is just full of the history of ancient Israel with a cycle of apostasy, punishment, and repentance, and forgiveness and restoration over and over and over repeated throughout their history. And when you study that history of the sacred history of ancient Israel, we have a picture of God. A picture of God emerges from these pages in the sacred Bible. A jealous God visiting the iniquity, and yet when they repent, he is so merciful, gracious, long-suffering, full of goodness and truth. See, God's jealousy and anger is provoked because of his love. No love, there will be no jealousy. If you can pick someone that you love very much, could be your spouse, your children, grandchildren, your best friend, whoever, you, someone you love so much. It could even be a pet that you love. How do you feel if that person cheated on you or rejected you and hated you? How are you going to react? I'm sure it's going to be a very complicated emotion, a mixture of, of shock, anger, hurt, sorrow, and pain. See, the reason why God called himself jealous is because God is trying to portray his pain, his anger, deep sorrow in his heart using words and emotions that we can understand and relate to. Yet, no human language can fully describe God's broken heart, his displeasure of being rejected and hated by us when we turn to other gods. But praise God, he did not leave us alone. He didn't say, oh, well, that's too bad. I'm just going to just uh, destroy this whole human race and create another. He didn't do that. You know why? Because he has that intense desire to win back our hearts. He wants to restore that love relationship with us. So what did God do to win us back? Next, we're going to go to the book of the Song of Solomon. It's a little book just before the book of Isaiah. If you know where Isaiah is, it's just before that. And we're going to read from chapter 8. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. I heard that this book, the Song of Solomon, was considered the most sacred book for the Jews. It has an, it's like an allegory of love relationship between God and his people. In fact, if you have the book Mount of Blessing, page 64, Ellen White quotes from some of the verses from the Song of Solomon, um, of, uh, Song of Solomon, and she describes the tender and sacred union between Christ and his people. So this whole book is full of rich, beautiful imagery and symbols in a very poetic language and style to portray the very intimate and exclusive relationship between Christ and his people. So let's read from Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. 
chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. It says, Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man will give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. Did you notice the word love appears three times? Along with the word jealousy and fire and flame. Love, jealousy, fire. Didn't we just read about them in the book of Deuteronomy? They're all tied together. As God's jealousy is another expression of his love. We're looking at God's love from a different angle. As if looking at a diamond, if you look from a different angle, it looks so different. So we're looking at God's love from a different angle, and we see God's jealousy. But why does the Bible say love is strong as death, and jealousy is cruel as the grave? Why? Because God's love and jealousy killed the Son of God, in order to save sinners who were deceived into following other gods. God wants to win back the hearts of the sinners to himself. If you think about it, wasn't it cruel for God the Father to send his only Son with the risk of eternal separation? Wasn't it so cruel for God the Father to allow his innocent son to be hanged on the cross as a criminal and let him die in humiliation to be buried in the grave? That's why God's love is the most vehement fire, so strong, so intense, so powerful. Nothing can put the sacred fire out. No earthly things can compare with that love. God invested all heaven, the life of his only son to save man. The more love, the more hurt he feels. If you invest a lot of time and energy for someone you love, maybe even facing near death to save that person, if you're rejected, aren't you going to feel that pain and sorrow? And yet, God, is a consuming fire. And that fire will consume all the impenitent people, the wicked, who reject God. Why? Why does God of love, why does he have to destroy all the sinners who refuse to accept Jesus? Did you know that love has a twin sister? Love has a twin sister. Her name is Justice. According to Testimonies for the Church, volume 5, page 559, 5T, 559, love has a twin sister. Her name is Justice. 
And we're told that these should stand side by side, love and justice. They cannot be separated. Love and justice are the foundation of God's government, the principle of his kingdom. So justice demands the life of a sinner if he rejects Jesus who died in his place. See, God cannot allow sin and sinners to remain in the universe. He cannot permit another rebellion, another great controversy to start all over. That's why consuming fire will destroy all the sinners and sins and cleanse the earth forever. But how does God feel when he destroys the wicked with his consuming fire? Here's what God feels. You can just jot down Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, where God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Turn, turn, turn ye, he said three times, turn back to me. Make a U-turn. Go, don't go the way you're going after other gods. Turn around and come back to me. That's the cry of God's heart. God is crying for those who refuse to turn back to him. And yet, if we refuse, God has no choice but to destroy sinners with their sins because of his justice. And at the same time, because God is love, God is giving sinners the right to choose to be lost if they insist on their own way. That's the freedom of choice. Love can never force anyone to choose him. That's why God is going to destroy the sinners with the second death. Bible talks about the everlasting fire. That doesn't mean the sinners are going to burn forever. But the results of that consuming fire is eternal. That's why it's called everlasting fire, because the results are eternal. Just imagine if sinners were allowed to live forever. This miserable, this wicked, the terrible world will continue and continue and continue with no end. The existence of sin means there are victims who suffer. That's why his consuming fire will destroy all the pain and all the suffering in mercy. So when does God going to begin this process of consuming the wicked, the sinners, those who reject God? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Zephaniah. It's one of those little books in the Minor Prophets. I know it's hard to find, it's just before Haggai and just before, uh, just after Habakkuk. I know that doesn't help. <laughs> but it's the little book, Zephaniah. Zephaniah. We're going to read from chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, where God declares, I will utterly consume all things 
From off the land, says the Lord, I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked. And I will cut off man from off the land, says the Lord. So when will God begin this process? Let's go down to verses 14 and 15. Verse 14 says, The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, and mighty men shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. His work of consuming will begin in the last days, just before the second coming. It will continue at the second coming, and even after the millennium, after the thousand years, it will be completed at the second death of the wicked. And verses 17 and 18 describe some of that scene. In verse 17 says, And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor, nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. In our society, we hear so much of that shallow, cheap love, cheap jealousy, cheap relationship that doesn't last. But we just saw from the Bible God's true love, his godly jealousy, Deep relationship that lasts forever. That's what God is after. He doesn't want to destroy the wicked. He wants us to return to him. And in this book, Zephaniah, in chapter 3, verse 8, God says, Therefore wait ye upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms, to pour upon my to pour upon them my indignation, even all my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So before Jesus can return, the whole earth, all the people living at that time, must be divided into two groups. Those who cling to other gods will end up worshiping the beast and his image. They're going to keep Sunday. But those who choose to forsake other gods and love God with all their heart is going to keep the seventh-day Sabbath. They're going to worship the Lord of the Sabbath. So what are we to do? We're living in a period just before that happens. Same book, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. What are we to do now? The Bible says, Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's Anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought this judgment. Seek righteousness, 
seek meekness. It may be, it shall be, ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. We are called upon to seek the Lord and his righteousness and his meekness. And then it, we're told, we're promised, ye shall be hid in the Lord. Hid. What does it mean to be hid in God? To be hiding in God. And did you notice in verse 2, the word before is used four times. Before the decree bring forth. Before this happens and that happens. So timing is crucial. If it's too late, we cannot be protected. So before the decree, what is this decree? When Jesus stands up and declares, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Do you see the two groups again here? Just before Jesus comes, there will be two groups. The unjust and filthy on one hand, the righteous and the holy on the other. That decree is the close of probation when there will be no mercy. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, 216. 5T, 216 says, when the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. So before the close of provision, God's judgment will, will be mixed with mercy. But after the close of provision, will be unmixed with mercy during a great time of trouble when the seven plagues will be falling. It's unmixed. It's, it's God's wrath. That's why we're told in the third angel's message in Revelation 14, which we are all familiar, we're told, if any man worship the beast and his image, the wrath of God poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. No mercy after the close of probation, after the decree. And the wicked who refused God's invitation of love and mercy are going to suffer with fire and brimstone. So today, right now, the question is, where are our hearts? Is it leaning, inclining toward God? Or is it still inclining toward other gods? Other gods come in all kinds of shapes and forms. Even things that are good in themselves. They can be a god, an idol. We always talk about the love of money or desire for wealth, but according to Steps to Christ, page 44, how about this God of reputation and worldly honor? Do we care more of what other people think of ourselves, what they say about us, above what God thinks of us? Is what people think of us more important? What about freedom from responsibility? That's a hard one for me. I like to go the easy way. I don't like responsibilities. That can be a God. According to Great Controversy 583, false doctrines and theories are like idol of wood or stone. When we're shown that this is an error, if we hold on to that, that can become a God. 
And also, she talks about philosophical idol. What about nature and environment? The god of politics, literature, journalism, education, fashion, music. They're a little better than Baal, she says, like Baal worship. The book Desire of Ages, two eighty, she says, cherished idea or idol of opinion, contrary to the truth of the Bible. That can be a god. And then four B.C. eleven forty five, Bible Commentary, volume four, eleven forty five, selfish pride. Oh, that's a very difficult one. Pride. Sensuality, and then she says anything made subject of undue thought and admiration, absorbing the mind, is a god. If we cling to those other gods, we become commandment breakers. In essence, we hate God, and God becomes a jealous God with no mercy. But if we choose to put away those gods, we become commandment keepers. We're going to love God. We're forgiven, and we're going to be receiving mercy. A lot of us we know these things. We understand it intellectually in our minds, and sometimes we make promises. We we make commitments. Sometimes there are appeals from the pulpit. We come forward, and we truly, sincerely believe: Yes, I want to put away those things. I want to follow you. But then, if you're like me, sometimes after a few days, a few weeks, after a few months, I'm back to square one. What happened? Like ancient Israel, we repeat the cycle. We fall into sin. We repent. We're forgiven, and then yet, we go through that cycle over and over and again. How can we remain faithful and experience this steady growth in Christ? Now, I'm going to end with this paragraph from. Six B.C. A Bible Commentary, Volume Six, pages eleven hundred to eleven hundred and one. Six B.C. eleven hundred to eleven o one. This is one of my most favorite quotation from the Spirit of Prophecy. <clears throat> I'm going to read in、um, a bite size. So we can appreciate each sentence. It says, "When self is submerged in Christ, true love springs forth spontaneously." Do you want to have true love for God? We don't work for it; it springs forth spontaneously, naturally. If self is submerged in Christ, submerged. That's what it means to be hidden in Christ. Then we can be protected. Remember, we just read from Zephaniah chapter two. We're going to be hid in God. We're going to be protected during that time when plagues are falling. We need to give ourselves, be submerged, covered totally. Now I'm going to read this next sentence. Talking about this true love, what is this true love? It is not an emotion or an impulse, but a decision of a sanctified will. Yes, love can involve emotions and feelings, but this true love. It's not an emotion or a feeling or impulse. It's a decision. We decide regardless of our feelings. Sometimes we don't feel like giving up something, right? I still want that thing. I I still want to eat that thing, whatever. But I'm going to decide to forsake it. Please take it away. So true love 
is a decision of a sanctified will. Are we willing to be made willing? I'm going to continue with the next sentence. It, that means true love, it consists not in feeling but in the transformation of the whole heart, soul, and character, which is dead to self and alive unto God. We just decide, okay, I'm going to die to myself, and I'm going to be alive in God. It continues, our Lord and Savior asks us to give ourselves to him. Surrendering self to God is all he requires, giving ourselves to him to be employed as he sees fit. So what do we need to do? What's the only thing we need to do? To give, to give ourselves. We just decide to give, even though you don't feel like it. And then the last section. Until we come to this point of surrender, we shall not work happily, usefully, or successfully anywhere. So God is waiting for us to, do, to come to this point of of surrender to totally giving ourselves, regardless of how we feel. So, if we decide to cling to other gods, God becomes a jealous God. And he's grieving and crying, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? But if we decide to seek God, God will help us examine our hearts to discern the other gods we have. Sometimes we don't even know we have other gods. So God is going to show us what is that, that particular God that we are still hanging on to. And then we're going to decide to repent, to choose to have them taken away, not by feelings or emotions or impulse, but the decision of the will. That's true love. It's a principle. So right now, the consuming fire of a jealous God is destroying, consuming, burning our sins and idols in our hearts. Right now, it's going to burn up our sins. So we can be ready when Jesus comes. So let's decide to turn back and seek the Lord, who is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, full of goodness and truth. And the promise is, when we surrender and give our whole heart to Jesus by faith, we are going to be protected. We, are, we have nothing to fear. True love. Let's experience it now and every single day and forever. Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you so much for your love, for your jealousy, for your desire to save us, to, to, turn, our back, to, to turn our hearts back to you. We thank you for your patience and your long-suffering. Help us to decide to follow you all the way. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.